Welcome to Broadway. We're so glad you have joined us today. If you are new here, welcome. And for those of you returning, it is wonderful to have you. My name is Kirsten and I'm a member here at Broadway. I want to share with you today some thoughts I have from Hebrews. Hebrews 4 talks a lot about entering God's rest. I encourage you to read it. For today, I have pulled themes from the message where it shares that God's promise of entering His rest still stands. That God has prepared this rest. That God's rest is there for people to enter. That people didn't enter God's rest, so we set another time, and that time is today. Let us do our best to enter that rest. In my Bible, there is a devotion tied to Hebrews 4 that shares, If we are immersed in the present, preoccupied with the pressuring issues of everyday life, we will never see His providential care for us. If we don't enter rest, our lives become cluttered and confused. We labor under the illusion that everything depends on us or on those around us. But it doesn't. Everything depends on God. This is the great lesson God has to teach us. I needed this reminder. I usually love to wake up early when the house is quiet, put on my cozy sweatshirt, grab a steaming cup of coffee, and sit by a window looking at the mountains and enjoying rest with God as His beauty unfolds in the sunrise. Lately, I've been neglecting and avoiding this time, this rest. I've spent time feeling exhausted, feeling I need to do everything myself, and striving to hold my life together in my own hands. To be honest, I fear God's rest right now. I fear that it is in His rest that I will fall apart. I fear that it is here where God will touch my grief. I fear that in His rest I will become weak. And I fear that in His rest I will realize I can't do it on my own, and it sure feels safer to try. Hebrews 4 reminds me that God's rest shows His providential care for us. It reminds us that our lives become cluttered and confused without it. Without God's rest, we labor and toil and inevitably fail. It is in God's rest where our eyes are taken off ourselves and placed on Him who is more than able. I invite you today to be curious with me about God's rest. Are you taking up this invitation today to enter His rest? If not, I encourage you and myself to en enter this endless open invitation to enter His rest, to be shown His care for you, to reorientate yourself and depend on Him the one who is more than able. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you offer us your rest. I thank you that you are intimate with us and that you desire to meet with us in our joys, in our grief, in our everyday details, Lord. That by entering your rest, it reorientates us towards you, to the author and king of our life who is in control, who is both on his throne, but also intimate with us in our daily details of our lives. Lord, I pray we would take this invitation to enter your rest. Lord, I pray for the world around us, Lord. I pray for the turmoil in Ukraine, in Russia, and in our own lives here with COVID and all the other things that are going on, Lord Jesus. I pray that we would take your invitation to find rest in you today and in this week, Lord, and that it would really impact the way that we are able to interact with others and with ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is, uh, it is really good to be with you all here this morning, and I've, uh, I've quite enjoyed sitting in the front row here. Uh, this is a great to have this young adult group uh, over here. Uh, I don't know how, how you char characterize yourselves. It's just, um, and see all the kids up front here. Uh, I have seven grandchildren between the ages of two and eight, and uh, I had three of the boys were overnight on Friday night, and uh, I love putting them to bed when they stay overnight at our place because I tell them stories of, uh, we spend a number of years in Africa, so I try and see how much I can scare them with stories of lions and elephants and rhinos and these kind of things, but we, I also tell them Bible stories, and, and so it's just awesome to see the kids up front here too, and uh, yes, I, I also did want to just share a thank you on behalf of, uh, of the British Columbia Mennonite Brethren Conference. And I, I know some of you probably 
aren't that aware of what the conference does and all of those kind of things. And I'm not going to say a whole lot about it. But your lead pastor couple here, Gary and Sharon, are really involved. And um, I, I, I've spent the last 10 years on the executive board of the conference, and I've seen Sharon as our BCMB conference moderator, and Gary uh, in the effort and the work he puts into the pastoral ministries committee. And it's a lot of work, and it's important work. And uh, we just want to thank you as a congregation that you've freed them up to be able to serve the conference in that way, because they, they really are amazing people that have been really doing a, t a tremendous work for us. So thank you on that side. Uh, you've heard a little bit about the college already, so I'm not going to give you a whole uh, Columbia Bible College ad, although I will say a few things. Um, I'll add to a little bit what Shar had to say. We've got 315 students on campus this uh, spring, and we had a great week this last week in terms of lots of applications for new students came in. But I do want to highlight that if you're still thinking of coming to Columbia, we've got room and we would love to have you on, uh, on campus in the fall. We believe and we are so excited to see students grow in their faith, in their knowledge of God's Word, and to recognize how incredibly relevant it is for us today. What constantly captures my attention about our students is their desire to learn, to grow, and to discover their purpose in life. And I would say the young adults that arrive at Bible College today are searching for many answers in, in terms of how to live. And I think some of the key issues, the key topics or themes that they're exploring have to do with questions around identity. Who has God created me to be? Around life, what is it that God wants me to do in this life? Around Jesus, is Jesus the only way to find salvation and life? Around the Bible, is it true and trustworthy? And also they ask questions around church. Is the church even still relevant for today? These are important questions, questions that we need to wrestle with, and it's an incredible time to be able to really lay the foundation for life. And so I love working at Columbia. I'm in my 18th year there, and uh, it it's, uh, it's continues to give me hope as I connect. And I was even thinking today... Um, do I really need to get up and preach? Maybe we should just continue to worship. I, I love the traveling ministry team. They do such a phenomenal job. Thanks, you guys, again. Well, soon I will be 60 years old, and perhaps more than at any other point in my life, it does feel to a certain extent that the world we live in has gone a bit crazy. The first part of the 21st century was characterized by 9-11, financial crises, identity politics, blindingly fast technological developments, and uh, a rapidly changing moral landscape. Then came the pandemic with its lockdowns, restrictions, and economic uncertainty. Now you can throw in the war in Ukraine, and we can easily feel overwhelmed with the pace of change, the polarization of opinions, and the sheer struggle to simply understand what it means to live with constant uncertainty. There's an oxymoron for you. Constant uncertainty. As I have tried to carry out my responsibilities at the college over the past couple of years, high stress and worry has been my experience more often than I would like to admit. When someone has asked me, how goes the battle? It's been easy to feel like responding with, I feel like I'm losing. Anybody else here relate to that feeling? But it's exactly at this time in history and in these kind of circumstances that we need to remember that the battle has already been won. This morning I'm going to focus on Revelation chapter 17 verse 14, a text that has been pivotal 
for me during the decade that I have served as Columbia's president. A number of years ago, while visiting a church in Saskatoon, I heard this verse read, and I was forever gripped by the following words. They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. To me, this verse provides the bedrock, the biblical foundation for not only what we're trying to do at Columbia, but for every aspect of who we are as Christians and what we do in life. As I've already indicated, we are located in a challenging period of history. As Christians, this can be quite disconcerting. Commentators have rightly noted that we live in a post-Christian, post-churched world. Many of our neighbors are not only uninterested in Christianity, they're actually antagonistic. Government mandates and laws opposing traditional Christian ethics regarding life and sexuality give us the sense that we're in a a spiritual fight. As we look at this passage in Revelations today, I'm not going to delve into end-time prophecies or try to identify the, uh, the identity of the Antichrist. Instead, I'm simply going to focus on some key themes that come from this verse. First, we will consider the image of Jesus, and then we're going to look at how his followers are described. And as we consider the Apostle John's vision, I hope we will be encouraged and challenged to live as called, chosen, and faithful followers of Jesus. Now, from a quick look at the context in in Revelation chapter 17, we find this verse occurs or appears in a section dealing with that age-old conflict between Satan and his forces and Jesus and his followers. In the middle of this battle image in Revelation, what appears so surprising is the description of Jesus not as a lion, but as a lamb. In the cosmic battle between the forces of good and evil, life and death, God and Satan, we are assured that the forces of evil will not prevail. For the Lamb who was slain has become Lord of lords and King of kings. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is only once described as the triumphing triumphing line of Judah. Whereas 26 times he is described as the Lamb who has overcome evil. The prophet John, the one who saw this vision, uses the image of the sacrificial lamb to displace that of the ferocious lion. Some years ago, the power of Jesus' sacrificial death was brought home to me in a song written by Chris Tomlin. The song speaks of the triumph of the lamb who was slain and who with his blood has redeemed humanity. And I find these lyrics so powerful. Mighty is the power of the cross. Mighty, awesome, wonderful is the holy cross where the Lamb laid down His life to lift us from the fall. Mighty is the power of the cross. What restores our faith in God? What reveals the Father's love? What can lead the wayward home? What can melt a heart of stone? What can free the guilty ones? What can save and overcome? Mighty, awesome, wonderful is the holy cross where the Lamb laid down His life to lift us from the fall. Amen? As we know, the paradox of Jesus' life is that by sacrificing Himself, He arose victorious and made salvation possible for all. For this reason, we don't simply put Jesus first, we place Him at the center of every aspect of life. Following Jesus isn't something you just do on Sunday. It has implications for our homes and workplaces, for our schools, the hockey rink, and the coffee shop. Recognizing the full reality of Jesus' identity makes the ensuing description of his followers so much more significant. We are told that Jesus is not the lone victor in this battle. He's not the only one who emerges victorious. But with him are his called, chosen, and faithful followers. That's us. 
And it's a pretty amazing description when you think about it. I want to take just a bit of time in the rest of, uh, rest of this sermon today to look at those descriptors. Called, chosen, and faithful. Quite some time ago, we at Columbia latched on to this theme of calling as a key component of what an experience at the college is all about. If you check our printed materials, our banners and promotional videos, all that stuff, you're going to find the words explore your calling uh, regularly uh, on, on that, those materials. And now when this idea was first introduced, I was quite excited about it because I resonated so strongly with this aspect of the Christian life. And we could easily take a week to explore all the passages dealing with calling in Scripture. This theme is a constant fixture in both Old and New Testaments. God is constantly calling out a people for himself. But this morning, I just want to look very briefly at one short passage found in the Gospel of Mark, verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 13 to 15, and it describes the calling of the disciples. We read there, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. When teaching on this passage, I often ask students a very simple question. Why did Jesus call the disciples? What did he want them for? How would you answer that question? Anybody want to just shout out an answer? Why did Jesus call the disciples? Have them, what was that? Pass on his teaching. Anybody else want to try? There we go. Thank you. Thank you, sister. So first thing it says in verse 14, that they might be with him. First and foremost, the call is to Jesus, to a relationship with him. It even says in this passage that he called those he wanted. The call is to a person, not to a cause, a philosophy, a set of rules, or even a way of life. That will come. But the disciples, and the disciples would eventually preach and cast out demons. But first, they had to be with Jesus. We are called to know Jesus, not to know lots of stuff about him. Jesus called his disciples because he desired their companionship, their friendship. We have been called, we've been invited to be with Jesus because he wants to be with us. Now a call, an invitation requires a response. The text says that he called those he wanted and they came to him. Reflect on that for a moment. Jesus is calling us all the time. Have we responded? Are we responding? How are we answering the call? We cannot understand the love of God simply by reading about it or hearing about it. We need to commit to following in order to experience life with Jesus. And I was, responded of that, I was reminded of that this past week as I was reading a, uh, a summary report from our women's volleyball coach at the college. She summed up the season as follows. They played some of their best volleyball in their lives. 13 of 14 of the student athletes are returning. Two girls gave their lives to the Lord this past year. What that says to me is that two of the girls that came to CBC this past fall to play volleyball, they didn't know Jesus. They weren't yet sure what it meant to follow him. They answered the call to be with Jesus. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning and keeps me going as president at Columbia. I want to see people responding to Jesus' call. Amen? The second descriptor of Christ's followers in Revelation 17, 14 is that we are chosen. Now, clearly, there's considerable overlap between being chosen and being called. But I do want to try, uh, try to highlight a couple of key emphases that are found in that word chosen. It points to God's initiative and sovereignty. In, the gra- in His grace, God moved in history, sending His Son and the Holy Spirit 
so that people might be actually drawn to him. The very word chosen implies that God loves and cares for us. And as Christians, we didn't earn the right to be chosen, just as an Israelite did not earn the right to become part of the people of God. They were born into it. In the same way, we also experience a new birth to become a part of God's people, the church. Colossians 3 verse 12 clearly emphasizes God's love for his chosen people. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And this verse from Colossians also introduces a second element suggested by the word chosen, purpose. We have been chosen for a reason. Listen to 1 Peter 2 verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. There's a purpose to this. We find a dual understanding of what it means to be chosen. First, we're loved. We are God's children, his treasured possession. And second, we have meaning. We have purpose. Being called and chosen suggests the idea of vocation. Too often in church, we have perpetuated the idea that the only calling is to professional ministry, to be a pastor or a missionary. And those are great callings, but God has chosen each one of us to be his servants and witnesses in whatever field he's equipped us to serve whether that's education, health, construction, law, agriculture, and we could go go on and on. Gordon Smith, in his great book called Consider Your Calling, puts it well. Our vocations are always received and responded to in light of the actual situations in which we find ourselves. And typically, there are circumstances over which we have very little control. We have been placed here in this time and space, and now we need to navigate our way through what has been what lies before us. What must be stressed is that wise women and men refuse to think of themselves as victims of their circumstances, but rather as those who have been providentially situated. Before God and in the grace of God, and we respond with courage, creativity, and patience to what is at hand. We have a calling. Just this uh, past Friday, actually, I was having coffee with one of our grads from about 10 years ago. And when he was at college, he thought he was being called into cross-cultural mission. And he actually started going down that road for a period of time. But over the last number of years, God has been just kind of gently guiding him. And he's now started his own company, which is doing really well. And we were talking about what that his kind of mindset that he's bringing to it of being a missional entrepreneur. And as I listened to his story, what was so exciting to hear is how God is using his gifts and the talents and the skills that have been developed to enable him to be able to connect with a whole bunch of folks. And he's had so many opportunities to share Jesus in the midst of this vocation that God has called him to. Let's be open to what it is that God is choosing us for. Finally, we're called to be faithful. I am finding myself increasingly drawn to this depiction of God's people. It is relatively easy to begin well with lots of enthusiasm, full of vim and vigor. But what happens when we experience the inevitable trials and tribulations of life? What happens when faced with sickness, betrayal, persecution, the death of a loved one, economic calamity, or some other tragedy? Faithfulness speaks of loyalty and perseverance and a willingness to sacrifice and suffer. In the fruit, list of the fruit of the Spirit, we find that both faithfulness and patience are mentioned. These characteristics of Jesus' followers are only evident after a period of time. They're evident in the long run. And the older I get, the more hesitant I am to make value judgments regarding people. People look at our students and sometimes they hold up a shining example. And I think to myself, be careful. What we see right now is great, but will they persevere? 
And I would say the same thing is true sometimes of our church leaders. We hold them up as almost as celebrities, but we see too often the failures. At the same time, sometimes I've heard people kind of bemoan a certain student and they're like, oh, I don't like what that student's doing. And I might not be very happy at that particular point in time either. But I caution people and say, are we praying for that particular student? Are we encouraging them? And let's see what happens in the long term. Will they be, be found to be faithful? Will they persevere Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And on another occasion, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. At the end of that great chapter on faith in, uh, found in Hebrews 11, we read, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised, but only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. One of my great joys as president of the college is I go around and I raise money. What, you're surprised? At that? It's actually a lot of fun sometimes. I, meet, I sit down with older folks and we talk about their life stories. And I've heard such amazing accounts of God's faithfulness to them, but also how they have been faithful to God. And, and these folks, sometimes I'm sitting there listening, and I, they have become my heroes. Just this quiet confidence, this quiet faith that they have that God is there, He's present, He provides Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then that, that challenged us again. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's be faithful. Faithfulness flows from a life fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So it's time to conclude. They will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. As I mentioned earlier, I believe we have entered a period of history that is already proving difficult for the church, and it may become more difficult in the years ahead. The cultural tide has turned against Christian values, beliefs, and ethics. We may be tempted to turn away, to choose a path that is easier, less offensive to the powers that be. But Jesus has promised that he will be with us, even to the end of the age. So let's not lose heart. Let's not lose hope. John Mark Comer, in his brilliant book, Live No Lies, a book I highly recommend. Has anybody here read the book, Live No Lies by John Mark Comer? I, I got some people that, you guys, read this book. This is a phenomenal book. Um, he writes there near the conclusion, the idols of ideology are failing. What if in the aftermath, people were to turn back to the living God? People can't live without meaning, purpose, and community. The secular world can't seem to offer that. Jesus can, and he does. What if the church were to come back to her call as a community radiant with the love of God? Nobody knows where the West will go in the years to come. The smartest people can only guess. But this could be the church's finest hour. Jesus is the Lamb who has overcome the world, and he has called chosen and faithful followers are those who acknowledge him as King of Kings. And may this be true of us today and every day of our lives. Let's bow together in prayer. Lord Jesus, you truly are King of Kings, Lord of Lords. You are the Lamb that has won the war. 
Your sacrifice on the cross has set us free, has redeemed us, has made us righteous in you. So Lord, we pray that you would help us to fulfill the plans and purposes that you have for our lives. May we live lives that demonstrate your glory in this world. And may we demonstrate your love to the people that we come into contact with, whether it's here in our communities or any other place around the world. Lord, we thank you that you are with us and we bow before you again this day as our Savior, as our Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. I encourage you to join us Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. or connect with us on our website at broadwaychurchlife.com. I want to leave you with a blessing from Ephesians 3. I ask that out of the riches of His glory, He may strengthen you with His power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Then you, being rooted and grounded in love, will have power, together with all the saints, to comprehend the length and width and height and depth of the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week, and we hope to see you again soon.